Order members, order. It is now time for questions to the Minister for the Economy. And I call Steve Egan. For one, please. Can I thank the member for his question? Uh, the member will be aware that my responsibility is with maintaining and enhancing Northern Ireland's air connectivity, both domestically and internationally. I had a key role in securing the 5.7 million support package announced in May for the Belfast City and City of Derry airports and those airlines operating essential flights. This safeguarded our air connectivity with uh, GB during the initial COVID crisis period. In recent monitoring rounds, I've secured an additional two million to fund marketing support uh, by March 2021. Um, this will be delivered by Tourism Ireland. 0.8 million relates to cooperative marketing support for airlines operating to all three of Northern Ireland's airports, with 1.2 million on a campaign highlighting uh, all air and sea carriers serving Northern Ireland and their routes. I call Steve Aiken for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Minister for a reply so far? Uh, the Minister be aware, and I think I will refer to my learned friend from South Belfast on the issue, I think there's about 2.6 million in APD mitigation that we still return to the Exchequer each year. Uh, could, the minister, or could the Minister explain whether she or any of her officials have been in discussion with Belfast International Airport about supporting new transatlantic or Middle East routes? And if so, has she made the necessary commitments to allow this funding to, to occur and to allow us to improve our, both our economy and our tourism offer for next year? Again, uh, can I thank the member for his question. It's a very, very uh, important uh, issue that he raises. Um, yes, I have been in discussion with Belfast uh, International Airport around uh, two routes, uh, to, uh, one to New York, one to Boston, uh, and one uh, to uh, Doha. Um, these uh, routes um, will, this uh, proposal from Belfast International, of course, is a reserved matter, and uh, aviation is a reserved matter uh, for the Department of Transport. However, I have instructed my officials uh, to investigate uh, the idea of um, having um, support for routes, um, particularly um, to North America, um, in um, as part of our COVID recovery, but also as important for Northern Ireland's centenary year that we can expand our markets, our horizons, and our cultural exchanges um, with uh, other parts of the world. Um, I have also, uh, of course, um, been engaging uh, with uh, the Department of Transport um, on the UK Aviation Recovery Plan. Um, and I do uh, trust that government will bring this forward and finalise it as quickly as possible because it is an important part um, of our uh, recovery issue. And of course, APD on domestic flights is an important issue within that recovery plan as well. I view that as an unjust tax on travel to Northern Ireland. I call Pam Cameron. Minister, for her answers to the question so far. Um, and I welcome the fact that the Minister has made £2 million available to support airlines at this difficult time. Um, and I think she's in agree agreement uh, with me uh, that more should be done uh, in terms of central government support uh, in helping our connectivity. And, uh, and that would include scrapping APD on short haul flights, at least for the short to medium term. Um, could I ask what emergency support is available to Belfast International Airport in particular, which is a very large employer within South Antrim, um, in terms of funding from this assembly to help in what are dire financial times? Thank you uh, for the question. Um, just to put on the record here in the House today, tomorrow I will uh, have a conversation with Sir Peter Hendy, who is uh, conducting the Union Connectivity Review. Um, and of course, I will be raising the issue again of APD, also the issue of the interconnectedness of our union and the importance uh, of connectivity to GB as our main uh, market for both goods and tourism. 
Uh, in relation to direct support uh, for Belfast International Airport, the member will understand that it is the role of the Department of the Economy to give support to air connectivity. The support for airports relies uh, on uh, the Department of Finance and, of course, the Department of Infrastructure. And I note that the Infrastructure Min Minister has made 1.2 million available for the City of Derry Airport. And I would urge uh, that a recovery package for both Belfast International and Belfast City Airport uh, comes forward as quickly as possible. If we do not have viable airports and connectivity, then our recovery will be slower and that will be more difficult for everyone in the long term. This is a really important issue. I raised it at the executive last week. I expect to see that package come forward as quickly as possible. I call John O'Dowd. In relation to travel arrangements, Minister, the Minister will be aware that students are desperately seeking information as to when and how they can travel home safely over the Christmas period, whether it's to here or from here to somewhere else. Will the Minister work in conjunction with the Health Minister to ensure students have that information? We, of course, have uh, an interdepartmental group which is looking at this issue and uh, which is being governed by advice from the Public Health Agency. You will have noticed today um, in the headlines that Queen's University are already introducing significant testing so that students can travel with a degree of confidence and go home uh, to their, their home place with a degree of confidence. And of course, we have had uh, constructive engagement uh, with the Secretary of State for Education, Gavin Williamson, uh, and Michelle Donlan, the minister, the university's minister, over the issue as well. Moving on, I call Andy Allen. I find my glasses. Things will look brighter. <laughs> Thank you uh, to the member for his question. My department has spent 353 million supporting individuals and businesses since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. This covers the period 31st of October uh, this covers the period up to the 31st of October 2020 and includes 243 million on the 10K small business support scheme, 73 million on the 25,000 retail hospitality, tourism and leisure grant scheme, and 23 million on the micro business hardship fund. I will place full details of the interventions broken down by measure in the assembly le uh, library. In addition to the 253 million to support individuals and businesses, a further 6.6 .6 million has been spent my, by my department on COVID interventions for higher and further education sectors. I call Andy Allen for supplementary. Thank you, the Minister, for answer. Minister, it will come as no surprise that uh, repeatedly and daily constituents right across Northern Ireland are contacting myself and other members indeed uh, in relation to the COVID restrictions business support scheme, pleading and begging for those payments to be made to them. Minister, can you advise what additional support you are going to provide to Invest NI to ensure that that money is uh, got out onto the ground to those individuals who desperately need this money now? Um, the member will be aware, but I do think it is worth reminding uh, the House, um, as I reminded executive ministers this morning, there are two uh, schemes in operation. One is for those businesses that have a rates-based, and that is operated by the finance minister, and that is by far the very largest proportion uh, of the funding that will be available um, for businesses in the current uh, period of restrictions. The, the scheme that I am running, Part A, is obviously for those uh, people who do not have a premise, and that is a much, much smaller part uh, of the scheme. I can uh, report that my uh, officials in InvestNI actually worked uh, throughout the weekend. Um, around half of all of those who have applied have now been paid. Um, everyone that has applied and used an accountant's letter as a verification has now been paid, and that means that about 3.6 million um, has gone out into the local economy. We are now down to some of the elements of this where uh, this is very much a manual um, um, scheme um, and where we are now uh, having to uh, phone and address those issues of assurance and verification. And I'm sure this House would agree me, with me that it is important to get the balance right between getting money out and the verification and assurance that taxpayers deserve around that money. 
I call Kiva Archibald. And um, similar to, to Mr. Allen, I suppose I would ask. Um, obviously, there is some frustration out there both between businesses and individuals around slower payments. Have you looked at, or will you look at, allocating additional resources, um, particularly in terms of personnel, to ensure schemes get out quickly? Particularly as there are new schemes coming on board around the newly self-employed, and when will that ex be expected to open? Um, I um Please. Around 100 officials from Invest and I are working on the two parts of the current uh, scheme. Um, as I've said, it, those are, they are complex schemes. They are not one-off payments. They have to be verified and they have to be measured. So they are complex schemes and difficult um, to get through. Um, they will continue to work on those as quickly as possible. But I would ask that... Um, Members of this House help by getting out the, the, the more information that we can receive about the application, the quicker then the response will be. However, I do recognise that there are many people who are hurting, many people who need money out um, very quickly, and that these restrictions um, in the run-up to Christmas um, are very, very difficult for people to deal with, and we will endeavour to do that as quickly as possible. Although I do again say that the vast majority of support will be delivered through the Finance Minister. The issue around the self-employed um, scheme, if I may take the time, Mr Speaker. Um, um, I had... Um, asked and I have circulated a paper for those who were recently self-employed and indeed those who were company directors. My initial bid to the finance minister was for 70 million in relation to those uh, particular schemes. I have been allocated 30 in total, 10 that I was allocated in a previous allocation and 20 today. Those schemes will reflect the allocation made to me by the finance minister. I call Christopher Stelford. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And it's in relation to the point that the, finance, or that the economy minister has just made. In questions to the finance minister, I asked the economy minister. No, I asked how much money the economy minister had bid for. Now I heard a figure in excess of three hundred million pounds. When I checked the BBC website, it was recorded as one hundred and ninety million pounds. Can my colleague confirm that she has? She submitted a bid in excess of £300 million and has received from the Finance Minister £137 million. I can confirm that uh, we submitted a very wide-ranging uh, number of bids to the Finance Minister. Those were well in excess of £300 million because we believe... Um, that the economy needs to be stimulated in order to recover. We need to offer help to those who have been impacted, but we need also to have uh, the stimulus scheme that the economy, and particularly the high street, will require in order to recover. So I can confirm that. Thank you. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. A number of financial assistance schemes were outlined today by the Finance Minister, as we have heard. So can I ask the Minister outline if any of this funding is going to be allocated to fill the gap and give support to those who have received nothing to date? And if not, why not? Well, um, the member will have seen uh, the variety of schemes that were allocated today. If she'd like to identify the gap that she's talking about, then of course we can talk about it. I call Andrew Muir. Question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you uh, for uh, your question. Um, my officials are actively engaging with their counterparts in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy to ascertain what, if any, changes are required to employment law in Northern Ireland following the extension of the coronavirus job retention scheme. HMRC is responsible for the scheme and its eligibility criteria. However, I understand that employees who were on the payroll on the 23rd of September 2020, but who were made redundant or stopped working for their employer afterwards, can be re-employed and claimed for. As the scheme is operated by HMRC, any employer which requires information on the extension should contact HMRC directly. I firmly believe that employers who have been able to take advantage of the scheme should treat staff fairly and respect employees' rights. 
including those relating to redundancy, consultation, notice period and redundancy pay. This is why I previously introduced legislation to ensure employees furloughed under the original scheme would not see reductions in these entitlements. Any individual who believes their employment rights have been breached should consider contacting the Labour Agency Workplace Information Service for confidential and impartial information or the Law Centre in Northern Ireland, which continues to provide free, independent, specialist legal advice on employment rights. Nicole Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. I think the extension of the furlough scheme is something that this entire House could welcome, but the lateness in the hour in terms of that announcement, it was in hours before it was about to expire, it was a real issue. Will the Minister consider bringing forward either primary legislation or other rules or regulations to ensure that people do not lose their accrued entitlement as a result of being made redundant and then re-employed? Is that something the Minister is prepared to consider? I am, um, and I do agree with you that uh, the lateness of the hour in um, bringing forward the extension uh, of the scheme has caused significant problems um, for both employees and uh, for employers um, who had already made their business plans based on another set of circumstances. Um, so I, I fully agree with you, and you will have heard me call on numerous times uh, for the job retention scheme to be extended, particularly for sectors that still have a significant tailback and will have in terms of their recovery uh, from the, the pandemic. I will, of course, uh, instruct uh, officials to look at any gaps there may be, but no employee being re-employed should actually suffer disadvantage. And uh, if there are to be um, redundancies while that person is on furlough. It should not be based on their furlough wage, but on their full entitlement um, so that people are not disadvantaged in that way either. I call Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers today. The Minister will be aware that legislation went through the House last week on domestic violence, which was much long overdue, and we, we really welcome it. Can the Minister advise on her views on special paid leave for victims of domestic abuse? That is uh, beyond this question, but if the Minister wishes to form an answer, that is over to her. I, I think, um, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker. I think this is an issue of huge importance, and it is important that the Minister that is charged with employment rights um, should um, take a view on this. Um, so therefore, um, I know that there is huge support in this House uh, for this particular issue. Um, and I do recognise that some employers already act in a compassionate and uh, a progressive way in relation to this issue with people that have worked for a long time uh, within uh, their business. And therefore, I have asked officials to give consideration to this and will revert to the House in due course. I call Emma Rogan. Yes, can call you. Minister, it's concerning that some employ employers have adopted policies recently of firing and then rehiring workers under poor terms and conditions, like signing zero hour contracts, etc. Minister, will you look to amending the legislation to ensure that workers are not open to this exploitation in this way? It's difficult for me uh, to. Um speak of individual uh, circumstances, um, but what I would say that employers should not use the pandemic uh, to abuse uh, or negate uh, employees' rights. That is why I introduced uh, the legislation around uh, furlough payments uh, and uh, potential redundancies. And I would advise any employee who feels that their rights have been abused uh, to contact uh, the Law Centre or the Labour Relations Agency, where there will be very specialist advice um, for people uh, who will be able to take it forward for them. Moving on, I call Morris Bradley. Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I would like to group uh, question four, question six and question 14. 
And I would also ask uh, for your permission for an extra minute in answering uh, these particular questions. And were Mr. Speaker here today, he would be astounded that I'm answering question 14. <laughs> um, my department has developed a number of packages to support younger workers and those most adversely impacted by COVID-19. An apprenticeship recovery package has been established to encourage the return to work of up to 4,500 furloughed apprentices and their retention through to the successful completion of their apprenticeship. Those apprenticeship skills will play a significant contribution in maintaining the skills pipeline and supporting the renewal um, of uh, the wider Northern Ireland economy. Members will also note that I have um, introduced um, a scheme uh, to support new apprenticeships and an apprenticeship challenge scheme to try to get innovative apprenticeships uh, up and running. I have also allocated um, 6.2 million to support the provision of free flexible training for up to 5,000 individuals who have been directly impacted by the pandemic. Courses are available in all of the further education colleges and in Queen's University, Ulster University and the Open University. And I would encourage anyone whose employment has been hit by the pandemic to explore these opportunities. Members are also aware that I have recently launched the COVID restrictions business support scheme to provide support to businesses and individuals directly impacted by the ongoing restrictions and those within their supply chain. I would note that the vast majority of support is being provided to those through the Occupy premises through the localised restrictions support scheme run by the Department of Finance. I have repeatedly said that we need to find ways to live with this virus. Therefore, facilitating the safe reopening of our economy is, of course, the most effective way we can help those across society adversely impacted by the restrictions. Utilising assessments such as the one produced by my department on the potential economic impact of the four-week circuit breaker will help the executive take balanced decisions around the timing, scope and duration of restrictions. I call Morris Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, would the Minister agree with me that irrespective of what grant support is made available, that the best support the Executive can give is to allow businesses to trade? The Minister previously launched a scheme to help businesses to get online, That's something that would allow smaller businesses to continue to trade even if they're shut. Does she have any plans to continue or enhance that scheme? Again, can I thank the member for his question. I am on record as saying over and over again that the best way to help businesses is to help businesses to trade in an open, safe and effective way. And I deeply regret that we will have two further weeks of restrictions um, in the run-up uh, to Christmas. However, the Health Minister has advised that this is necessary um, to stop our hospitals being overrun. But it will be difficult um, for those individuals who are impacted. And one of the ways that we can try to help businesses is to help them to have a dual offering, and that is some online presence as well. So back in October, we introduced the Digital Selling uh, Capability Grant. That was a small tester grant to see how that would work within the economy. That has been... Um, significantly oversubscribed um, and I therefore am pleased that the Finance Minister has uh, allocated a further three million in relation to that particular grant scheme which we will be able to open up uh, again um, and I have also asked um, Invest NI to look at the thresholds within that grant scheme so that it is open to a wider range of small businesses. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister uh, for her answer and the commitment to apprenticeships and skills training, particularly targeting resources at our young people. But uh, can, can the Minister confirm whether or not her department has looked at where there's any forecast of job vacancies in the, in the next six to 12 months so that uh, young people will be better informed through the careers advice that might be available to them as to what options to take? 
We already know uh, that within our economy that COVID has not been uh, equal in its impact on, on sectors across the economy. So sectors like hospitality or high street have been very, very adversely impacted by COVID. But some sectors have actually been powering ahead in this particular um, really difficult and challenging period. So we, we have seen and continue to see significant uh, growth in the numbers uh, of people and young people and people of all ages um, who are able uh, to... Um, um, gain employment within, for example, the digital or, and tech sectors. Um, and we have been looking at how we can help young people to get into these particular sectors, particularly through the Shared Skills Academy routes. Um, and the one that we ran with Microsoft, and I mention it often because it was a fantastic way for young people to gain experience of the sector and to gain employment. 24 young people took part in that Skills Academy, delivered online at the height of COVID. 23 young people are employed today. Call Joanne Bunning. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, we've heard a lot in the Chamber today about need and the delays in grants getting out there. Unquestionably, it's imperative that people do get the money that, th that they so desperately need. But would the Minister confirm the ratio between the delays of grants from her department and the delays in grants from the Department of Finance? And also, uh, would she outline what support she receives from executive colleagues when she makes the case for the survival of businesses and colleagues whenever they're discussing uh, restrictions and lockdown? Was her department's I think the member has asked a number of questions. Was her I think the member has asked a number of questions. Of, if the member, of, order, order. Members have asked a number of questions and had a lead in. I asked the minister and asked the question. If you want to ensure your question, the key question is put, put it early. Minister. Um, I, um, it is no surprise to you that um, I advocate at all times um, for um, an open and free economy that's able to safe, or trade safely in these COVID pandemic times. That is difficult. And I think that for many people, um, they will have seen the agonies um, that uh, the executive have put themselves through in relation to this. Um, with um, the restrictions uh, over the last uh, period of time. That is because um, the balance is very difficult and very difficult to get right. But it's also imperative that we recognise that in closing down our economy, we impair the life chances of our people and our community. And that is something that weighs heavily on my mind and I never fail to take the opportunity uh, to advocate on behalf of those people. COVID has disproportionately impacted the young women and the working poor in relation to their life chances. And we need to see our economy open up again um, before Christmas. Um, I don't have uh, the figures for the finance grant, but I have given freely and transparently the figures in relation to the COVID restrictions grant uh, that I uh, am working on. Um, and I will continue to uh, work in a transparent way with the Assembly on this issue. I call Pat Sheehan. I've got uh, a young caller. Uh, Minister, two weeks ago, the, uh, the DUP vetoed public health advice and created uh, uh, a sense of confusion among the business classes that will be safe to open up. Uh, would the Minister accept now that the entirely inappropriate use of a cross-community veto has created unnecessary confusion and created uncertainty among businesses and among wider society? I would, of course, um, correct the member uh, and indicate to him that the decision that was taking, taken uh, on the previous occasion was taken with the support of the Health Minister. In fact, it mirrored almost identically, except for close contact services uh, and for coffee shops, the actual um, request from the Health uh, Minister in his paper. Furthermore, the decision to close down uh, on the 27th is again at the request and recommendation of the Health Minister, backed up um, by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer. That is clear and has uh, been respected by the executive as a whole. And that is the end of our period for listed questions. And we now come to topical questions. 
and I call Colm Gildenew. Gorham Agat, last Kian Corlea, and Gorham Agat, uh, Leishanaira. Minister, businesses have waited now for four weeks on the opening of Part B of the COVID restrictions business support scheme. You have now stated that in order to make payments under Part B, you will close Part A to new applicants. It, is, it does appear to me incredible that two applications process cannot be run in parallel. So, Minister, given the fact that business were left in the dark for so long, will you extend these application dates so that eligible businesses will have sufficient time to apply and receive money into their accounts before Christmas? Thank you. Um, I congratulate the member on a brave attempt to throw confusion over the issue. Um, when I indicated that we would separate the two parts of the grant scheme out, it was before we were to have a further period of restrictions. These will, of course, run in parallel, and they will take account of the new timescales for those restrictions to apply. I call Colin Kilsen for supplementary. Agat, and I thank the Minister for her answer, and I'm sure that will be a, a, a great relief to business. Can I ask, would the Minister consider um, the issue of photographers who are largely unemployed as a result of not themselves directly, but the business they serve as part of the supply chain? Would she consider extending that scheme to photographers? Part B um, of the grant scheme specifically, at my request, actually indicates uh, that those people who are not directly in the supply chain but cannot operate because their part uh, of the economy is closed should be considered as well. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, could you please provide us with an update on the op um, Safely Opening Group and the work that you'll be involved in over the next few weeks? These are issues uh, that uh, the Executive Office will take forward. Um, I, of course, continue at all times uh, to have conversations with the wider hospitality industry, uh, with the retail industry, uh, etc. But uh, the Executive Office uh, officials from my department uh, and um, the Health Department and the Public Health Agency uh, are involved in the rest. Called Paul Branch over supplementary. Um, thank you for your um, response. Given we know more around the transmission of the virus in enclosed spaces, um, are you minded to bring forward um, a financial support scheme for those businesses with a large number of employees who would be quite set at read during the day so that they can improve the ventilation systems in their, in their business premises? I think that that was one of the issues that was raised um, through this, and if it is identified as an issue by the Public Health Agency, uh, then I think it is incumbent upon the Executive to make money available for it. I call Gemma Dolan. Good, last can call you. Minister, I want to firstly welcome the rollout of Project Stratum and the fact that it will improve the broadband connectivity for many in my constituency. However, I do have concerns around the fact that 575 premises in my constituency will not benefit from the initial rollout, despite being in the targeted intervention area. Minister, can you give a timeline as to when you believe these premises will be covered? Well, of course, I was delighted um, that we were able uh, to announce the beginning of Project Stratum. I think that that is good news um, for Northern Ireland uh, and is a direct result of the confidence and supply arrangement uh, that the DUP had uh, with the Conservative government. That will be a lasting legacy uh, for Northern Ireland. Um, there are a number of premises that will not uh, benefit in those target areas, and we are committed to working with DCMS to make sure that we can include uh, the vast and overwhelming majority of those premises uh, within uh, the intervention area. This is an exciting project, 76,000 homes in Northern Ireland uh, that are difficult to reach, uh, will have broadband um, and high-speed internet access. That is an exciting project, not just for the individual, the family, um, but also for the connectivity of the economy in Northern Ireland and the competitiveness of the economy in Northern Ireland. I call Gemma Dolan for supplementary. And yes, Minister, I do agree it is exciting, but um, one of the ongoing issues in terms of broadband and the digital divide has been that broadband providers prioritise urban areas for upgrades and improvements, while rural areas are left behind. My fear is that as technology develops, rural areas will be left behind 
will be left with superfast broadband, whereas urban areas will move to ultra-fast broadband. Minister, have you received any guarantees that Fibrous will upgrade rural broadband services in the longer term so that rural areas can keep pace with urban areas? Well, first of all, um, can I indicate to the member that 97% of the target intervention area for Project Stratum is uh, rural Northern Ireland or settlements of less than 1,000 people. I think that, as I've said before, is hugely important for the connectivity of the economy, for the balancing up of the economy in Northern Ireland, uh, and for making our economy more competitive. Um, it, in terms of the actual broadband, I mean, Fibrous have a, a contract to deliver um, on the, the specifics of their uh, particular contract. However, we do recognise that these things are changing and moving at a very, very uh, vast speed, uh, and uh, we will try to keep up with that, um, given uh, the constraints of any particular contract that they have. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Minister. Uh, does the Minister agree with me that the delay in delivering the uh, payments due under Part A of the COVID-19 business support scheme, um, that it is unacceptable, uh, causing huge distress and hardship, and confirm that the payments will be made as urgently and as quickly as possible and applied to for, that are applying for that support? Um, the COVID uh, restriction schemes, again, as I've said before, in this House fall into two parts. One is the local restriction scheme delivered by the Department of Finance. Um, and uh, I am not aware and do not have up-to-date uh, details in relation to that particular scheme. The second one is the um, local restrictions, um, which is being delivered, or the, the restrictions one, which is being delivered by my uh, department. That uh, grant scheme opened up uh, for business on the 28th of October. Um, and made its first payment on the 6th of November. It has now um, had um, almost half of all its payments uh, are out, um, and that has, represents about 3.6 million of assistance to date. All applications that have had an accountant's letter for verification have been paid, <clears throat> and Invest NI officials worked over the weekend on others which are more difficult uh, to verify. Part B of the scheme opened on the 18th of November. To date, 111 applications have been received and officials will be working as quickly as possible to verify these um, and get uh, payments out. I call Pat Catney for Thank you, Minister. Minister, um, it's, you have been provided with uh, additional uh, resources today to extend the scheme for the next two weeks. Uh, given um, and I'm going to be hard, the failure of the department which you oversee at the moment in order to get that desperately needed money out as quickly as possible. Can you provide a time field for the delivery of these grants to the businesses, please? The business uh, support schemes that are supporting businesses during uh, the periods of restrictions remain the same. I did, in fact, uh, indicate that because this was so close to Christmas, uh, and then many of our retail businesses um, would re should uh, actually receive a, an enhanced payment, but uh, was told that that was not uh, possible on this occasion and may actually even delay the, the payment uh, of, of uh, funding. Um, however, we will continue to work to ensure that businesses receive their funding as quickly as possible. I don't recognise uh, this as a failure. These are complex schemes that have to be delivered with assurance of taxpayers' money. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And I just want to continue on from the questions that Gemma Dolan was asking the Minister. Can I first of all congratulate the Minister um, on the announcement last week to do with Project Stratum? And of course, she's absolutely right. We wouldn't be in this position now if it wasn't for the DUP and the Confidence and Supply Agreement. But can I ask the Minister if she could maybe expand on that connect connectivity with the economy, especially as we go into, hopefully, post-COVID times? Yes. Um, can I thank the Member for a question? Project Stratum is new, it's exciting, it is not available anywhere in any other part of the United Kingdom, and it will provide greater connectivity, greater regional balance, 
um, and uh, help our economy to be more competitive. I think if we think of our, our current um, issues around the pandemic and around uh, the restrictions, we have seen a very clear demonstration how uh, connectivity, not just road or rail or air, but connectivity in the digital sense is so vital for our economy going forward. And many of the firms and companies that I talk to about investing in Northern Ireland, some very, very recently, have indicated that access uh, to good broadband schemes, but also the skills of our people and the resilience of our people in dealing with the huge difficulties that we have had is of major importance in uh, attracting investment uh, to Northern Ireland. So Project Stratum is a very significant and lasting legacy of that DUP Conservative confidence and supply deal. I call Paula Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for answers thus far. Um, and the Minister will know that we have many Indigenous businesses, many local farmers, and various people that in our rural communities. I don't understand it totally because I'm a townie and I have great broadband. Um, but it's just to ask the Minister what conversations she's maybe had with other ministers around concerns. I know that we've had concerns during lockdown with the Education Minister and how children will be able to access um, online learning. So it's just what conversations have taken place with those other ministers. Thank you. I am sure everyone in this House will recognise the real difficulties that there has been for families with poor um, connectivity. Um, I spoke to one uh, fa uh, family um, who had to take it in turns to actually access broadband in their homes. Um, and that is a, a very difficult situation when we have young people wanting to get online, schools trying to teach lessons online, and folk trying to work from home. That is a very, very difficult situation. Project Stratum um, will start to address these difficult issues. Um, and I'm delighted that it is rolling out. And indeed, for the uh, information of this House, I have asked Fibrous uh, to ensure that MLAs are kept well informed uh, about the rollout of Project Stratum in their areas. Akiva Archibald is not in her place. I call Melissa McHugh. Good last, Carla. Uh, Minister, over the past few weeks, you have spoken a lot about poverty low pay and employment in relation to uh, the increased restrictions. However, neither you nor previous DUP ec economy ministers have addressed the issue of low pay and work poverty. In fact, since 2014, Invest NI uh, have supported 3,950 jobs that pay below the real living wage. Minister, if you are serious about this issue, will you give a guarantee that public money will be used to create jobs that pay at least the minimum a real living wage. Can I thank the member for his question? He raises an issue that is very, very important uh, to me personally. COVID and the restrictions of COVID have impacted on families and the working poor very, very significantly. If you are on furlough receiving 80% of your salary, um, that will significantly impact your ability to pay the mortgage, meet the grocery bill and do everything that families normally do. So I am really concerned that if we continue in a cycle of lockdown that we will simply perpetuate the difficulties for particularly the working poor, particularly for women who rely on the hospitality sector for additional funding uh, for the family. Um, and for many other sectors for which uh, this is a real issue. We need to get to a stage where our economy is open and able to function appropriately. And we will only do that, not just with restrictions, but with better testing um, and uh, with the vaccine, which we hope to see rolled out in Northern Ireland in the future. I am committed to ensuring that we are not um, having a race to the bottom, either in the jobs we create or the conditions and restrictions we impose on the economy. And that concludes our time of questions to the Minister for the Economy. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments for the next item of business.